Jan van Eyck is one of the founding fathers of our understanding of realism. In his paintings, we encounter figures, we encounter landscapes that are recognizable. That uh, means that with the paintings of Jan van Eyck, we transcend the symbolic pictorial languages of the late Middle Ages, and it has been for a long time, this realism that has fascinated people and led to a great admiration of Van Eyck. This preoccupation with the painting technique and the realism um, has its downside, as it kind of obscured the fact that Jan van Eyck and his contemporaries were very much using pictorial typologies and formulas which were less modern than they would appear. And it is sort of like this dichotomy between, you know, elder um, traditional compositional types and this new realism, uh, which uh, the early Netherlands painters are introducing, which makes this transition of Byzantine into modern Western art uh, so particularly fascinating. So if we look at the again altarpiece, and the figure of Godfather or Christ or God the Almighty is actually based on earlier models that are rooted very firmly in the Byzantine tradition of uh, you know, early Christian mosaics. Uh, the idea of the Pantocrator that we find not only in apsis mosaics in uh, Byzantine churches, but also in uh, Byzantine icons. Jan van Eyck is not the only one. He is maybe one of the first who are looking at Byzantine types. But other painters like Roger van der Weyden, like um, Robert Campin, the so-called master of Le Mal, Hans Memling, Dirk Bauls, they all at some point or the other are repeating these kind of um, Byzantine icons, not only because they are fashionable in that way, but also because they wanted to increase the um, authenticity of the image uh, towards the audience. So in a way you could argue that the emulation of Byzantine uh, models uh, added uh, a new dimension to the artworks, an almost uh, yeah, intangible dimension. These images were venerated and um, believed to be containing powers and to relieve people from their sins. So you find uh, images of Christ or images of Godfather regularly in different media. You find them in panel painting, but you also definitely find them in um, manuscript illuminations and books of ours, which are actually sort of like transcending from the Byzantine prototype. And it's rather interesting to see that this um, development took place uh, around the, the end of Jan van Eyck's life with, uh, when he painted a few of these um, holy faces, actually, something which doesn't exist in Byzantine art, but, uh, but is a kind of translation. It's kind of the reinvention of the icon. That happens at the moment that, of course, Christendom uh, was very much challenged. And so there was a renewed interest in the East. And it's kind of interesting that um, from the image of the Holy Face, images of the Sudarium became popular. You know, Vera, Veronica, which is, is a literal translation of the, of the true icon, the Vera icon, um, uh, is sort of like becomes like an iconographic vessel that is used to promote the image of the uh, of the face of Christ. There are a few of these images, you know, um, images that um, transcend from the tradition of the Imago Pietas, that of the Man of Sorrow, which is of course another of these kind of iconic images that um, that um, were introduced uh, by. Italo-Byzantine icons uh, spread within Italy up to the north. That is the Man of Sorrow. Of course, shows the body of Christ in the state of torment and presents um, the Son of God in a, yeah, in a, in a transcendental position between death and uh, resurrection. And so what happens is that the image of the Imago Pietatis becomes 
And that's another transformation of a originally Byzantine type into Western iconography becomes like um, an image that is associated with the Mass of St. Gregory. Now, the Mass of St. Gregory um, is an image that uh, concerns the, um, the doubts uh, that were raised by the father of the church, uh, St. Gregory, that the transubstantiation was actually something real, something which became um, one of the central points of discussion in uh, Protestant thinking with Luther and Zwingli, etc., etc., and that uh, the man of sorrow, uh, you know, it's, it appears uh, during the Mass and sort of like uh, really uh, bleeds from the stigmata and into the uh, chalices uh, and, and thereby sort of like gives credibility to yeah, one of the central, um, central uh, liturgical uh, moments in the celebration of the Mass. But the transformation of images that were developed in uh, the East um, was not restricted to images of Christ alone, but also included um, images of the Virgin. Jan van Eyck, in, in many of his uh, Marian paintings, uh, deliberately harked back to specific icons. You do have to remember that the image of, um, of the Virgin Mary was connected with the legend of Saint Luke the Evangelist, who, as you probably know, had a, a vision where the Virgin and Child appeared to him, and he actually uh, is said to have painted the first portrait of the Virgin. Now, during the Middle Ages, there were several icons that were um, produced that were believed to be those original. One of them uh, was a painting that uh, came mid-15th century to the Cathedral of Cambrai and became an extremely, sort of like uh, quickly, uh, a venerated image that generated um, yeah, pilgrimages and the likes. If you start looking around with the image of Notre Dame de Grasse in mind, you recognize that there is a there are hundreds and hundreds of images of the most superb qualities by artists such as Roger van der Weyden, Dirk Bautz, uh, Hugo van der Goes, who all um, copied that very image um, um, in their own way. Um, and we admire them today because of their artistic uh, quality, but for the contemporaries, these paintings were mere vehicles to make sure that their devotional um, practices were carried out as efficiently as possible. In other words, you know, everything that you could do in order to reduce the time in Inferno, everything that uh, would bring you on a fast track to paradise was was done and the use of images uh, um, was uh, one way of obtaining that uh, goal another interesting examples in this uh, in this context is Jan van Eyck's Madonna at the Fountain this painting was apparently particularly popular there are several other copies and replicas made between, say, 1450 until the early 16th century by artists um, as diverse as uh, Gerard David or Adrian Isenbrand or Quentin Massais or the master of the Andre Madonna or you name it, that the reason that this image was so popular is most likely that it had an indulgency attached to that. So it's, it's very much... Um, you know, a, a, an extremely interesting uh, cultural phenomenon that not only means that specific uh, images are coming from the East to the West, that are adopted in the West, and while they are adopted, they're also changing functions, but also that they actually become a vehicle um, to demonstrate artistic skills that have been previously um, not at the forefront of uh, of these um, artistic endeavors.